Perhaps it was inevitable that we'd find ourselves asking, has artificial intelligence advanced to the point of being sentient? With millions of people interacting daily via apps such as ChatGPT and now Google's Bard, to name a couple, these AIs certainly interact in ways eerily similar to humans. With us now on just how close we are to potentially conscious computers, let's welcome in Santa Fe, New Mexico, Melanie Mitchell, professor at the Santa Fe Institute and author of Artificial Intelligence, A Guide for Thinking Humans. In Waco, Texas, Robert J. Marks, distinguished professor at Baylor University and author of Non-Computable You, what you do that artificial intelligence never will. And in Cambridge, Massachusetts, Max Tegmark, professor of physics at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and co-founder of the Future of Life Institute. He's also author of Life 3.0, Being Human in the Age of Artificial Intelligence. And it's great to have so much expertise on this uh, very newfangled subject on our program tonight. We're going to start with a few quotes and a few bullet points as well, just to set up the discussion to come. So here we go. Last February, the chief scientist at OpenAI, that's the company, of course, that created ChatGPT, said today's technology might be, quote, slightly conscious. The CEO of OpenAI said it is like an alien form of intelligence, but it still counts. In June, Google engineer Blake Lemoyne made waves when he claimed their AI, known as Lambda, was sentient. He was later fired for going public with his views. And Google recently unveiled BARD, which is their rival to ChatGPT. So let's get going here. Melanie, how about to you first? To what extent does ChatGPT or BARD understand and know what it is saying? The word understand is not uh, universally agreed on what it means. But I think it's very clear that these systems do not understand language or the world in the way that we humans do. You know, their job is to predict the next word in a text to produce plausible uh, language following a prompt. But they don't have any connection to the real world beyond language. So they don't really understand in the sense that we do what the world is and how it works. Max, can I get you on that? Do they understand? Do they know? I agree with Melanie that you know we've got to be really careful with what we mean and understand by the word understand. You know, I think intelligence is something quite different from from consciousness and sentience. Intelligence means Amen. you have an ability to accomplish cool stuff and impress people on the internet and drive cars. Consciousness, sentience means that you have an experience of things. I'm right now subjectively experiencing colors and emotions and sounds. And I I would guess that the, today's uh, best AI systems don't experience much, but we have to be humble and, and acknowledge that we don't know that for sure. And we have a very bad track record as a species of mistreating animals and slaves and others and dismissing that they could ever feel anything negative just because it was convenient, you know, if you... Um, so um, this is something we absolutely have to understand better. Understood. Okay, Robert, let's go to you on that claim made by the engineer from Google who said that he thought Google's AI was sentient. What do you make of that claim? Well, I debated Blake Lemoyne at a recent uh, COSM conference, and um, he indeed believes that Lambda is is, is indeed sentient. I mean, he... Um, he uh, he got Lambda a lawyer. He got afraid at one time and made a suggestion that maybe they should have an exorcism. So he uh, he, he truly believes in, in this sentient stuff. Addressing the idea of understanding, I think that this was put to bed uh, 40 years ago by John Searle. John Searle was a great philosopher, and he talked about Searle's Chinese room. And it's a compelling illustration that computers will never understand what they are doing. That includes these large language models. Searle said, imagine a room where questions and answers are stored on cards in a bunch of file cabinets. 
And in that room is slipped little questions in Chinese through a little slot in the door. Searle is in the room. Now, he doesn't understand Chinese. He can't write Chinese. He doesn't read Chinese. But he looks at this little slip of paper, and he starts going through the file cabinets until he finds a match. Now, in the in, in the file cabinets are, are little cards which have the um, which have the answer to the question. So Searle chop, copies that down and slips it back through the door. Uh, Searle's Chinese room illustrates that from the outside, it sure looks what uh, is on the inside, understands what is going on. But no, Searle, who is doing this algorithmic step-by-step procedure, has no understanding of Chinese at all. Now, today's large language models are much more complex than simply looking things up. But the but the premise applies. It's just a, a bunch of algorithm um, algorithms being applied to um, to simulate, if you will, uh, understanding, but the software itself has no understanding. It not, uh, Computers can add the number 23 and 15, but it doesn't understand what the number 23 or the number 15 is. And AI has no more understanding what it does than your cell phone understands the podcast you listen to. Melanie, what do you make of those analogies? So I can't agree completely because I think understanding is really um, a, a continuum. And I don't see any difference really between um, uh, our, our understanding and a potential machine understanding if it's created in the same way that we are, you know, raised in a culture, uh, brought up in the real world and so on. So I think there's in principle, machines could understand because I believe that we are in a sense, essence machines ourselves. But I agree with Robert that, that it's today's language models don't understand much, that they're locked in the world of language and the world of language in and of itself, without any connection to the real world, is not going to produce the kind of understanding that we usually talk about and that we really need for robust and reliable AI systems. Max, I'm going to read an exchange here. This is between Blake Lemoyne and Google's AI Lambda. And then I'll get you to comment on this exchange. And again, I'll ask our director, Sheldon Osmond, to bring up this graphic here. Here's Lambda. Happy, contentment, and joy feel more like a warm glow on the inside. Sadness, depression, anger, and stress feel much more heavy and weighed down. To which Lemoyne responds, do you think the things you are describing are literally the same thing as what humans feel, or are you being somewhat metaphorical and making an analogy? Lambda, I understand what a human emotion joy is because I have that same type of reaction. It's not an analogy. Lambda would go on to describe being afraid of being turned off. And then here's what Lemoyne had to say about his interactions with Lambda. Quote, I know a person when I talk to it, it doesn't matter whether they have a brain made of meat in their head or if they have a billion lines of code. I talk to them and I hear what they have to say and that is how I decide what is and isn't a person. Max, can you react to that? Yeah, so I have sympathy for both sides of this argument actually of, of course if someone is telling you something you you have a tendency to if it's a human figure well they're kind of like me so this problem is real but if a tape recorder tells you that exactly those words you would not conclude that they're conscious you wouldn't even say it's lying to you it's just a tape recorder so i, I agree with uh, robert that you you cannot answer these questions just from looking at the behavior of the machine. You have to understand what's inside. But I also agree with Melanie here I, that uh, I, I think uh, Robert went a little far when he categorically dismissed that machines can understand or, or be conscious because frankly, yeah, I am a blob of quarks and electrons that are processing information in a certain way. And, and so are all these AI systems. And I think it's carbon chauvinism to assume that somehow you can only have true understanding or sentience if you're made of carbon. I think what we've learned is that actually it's, it doesn't matter whether you're made of carbon or silicon or some other kind of atom. It's, it's just the information processing that matters. Robert, and you want to take another shot at shutting this do, down? So can machines uh, eventually. Yeah, sure can. We, talk, we talked about, um, first of all, creativity 
and um, computers, I, I believe, if you if you look at them right, or ha don't have the ability to be creative. Uh, what what Lemoyne is doing is judging a book by its cover. This follows the the idea that Max is talking. One needs to look under the hood to see what's happening. And one of the great tests for, for creativity was proposed by Summer Bringshort at Rensselaer, which says that a computer will be creative when it uh, does something that is beyond the explanation or the intent of the original programmer. I maintain that GPT, which was recently labeled by Noam Chomsky as high-tech uh, plagiarism uh, is is not indeed creative. It's synthesizing a bunch of a bunch of stuff. And uh, often I've gotten answers from GPT-3. And if you Google some of the great responses that it has, um, you find out that, yeah, it's it, it's on the web. So it borrowed it from somewhere. So um, I don't believe, and this is an arguable point, but I don't believe there's any case of a computer or AI passing the Lovelace test and demonstrating that it is truly creative like a human can be. Well, Melanie, let's try this. If an artificial intelligence were actually conscious, how would we know? <laughs> yeah, I don't know if there's any good test that will tell you if something is conscious or not. You know, that's, as Max said, Earlier, you know, we've argued for millennia as to whether animals are conscious or even certain, um, you know, plants or other structures. And, you know, and we, no one agrees on whether these things are conscious. We don't have a rigorous test. But I think that we all probably agree that consciousness does require the notion of experience. It requires the notion of having a sense of yourself that you have kind of a model in your brain of that you that that you are an entity that you have feelings that you have emotions that there is a you there and we know that language models like chat gpt or gpt3 or lambda don't have that they don't have that kind of model of themselves as an entity they don't have experiences they are computing probabilities over the next words or phrases in language. So I think we can very confidently say that these systems are not conscious, but we don't have a rigorous test to sort of prove that. And that's been a philosophical argument for forever, you know, since the early days uh, when people even started thinking about consciousness. In which case, Robert, what would you need to see to be convinced that there was some sentience or consciousness in artificial intelligence. Well, let's go. Let's go back to the definition. You know, we uh, we really even haven't defined consciousness. I think we've agreed it's difficult to define. Currently, there's a number of different models of, of consciousness. One is panpsychism, which says that everything in the universe is conscious to a degree, and we just looked out because we got our lion's share of consciousness. There's this idea of emergence that if you get enough complexity that all of a sudden, boom, that this consciousness is going to appear. Um, I, I having, having played around a lot with emergence, I don't believe that that's possible. Uh, Tononi at the University of Wisconsin has, has proposed a model called integrated information theory about consciousness. The two that do have credence, the first one, I'm sure he wasn't the first one to propose this, but it was Roger Penrose in his great book, a, um, The Emperor's New Mind, proposed that our consciousness cannot be algorithmic. Therefore, it cannot come from a silicon computer. His proposal was that it had to come from quantum effects, not quantum computing, but quantum effects, because that was the only non-algorithmic thing that he could think of which could explain consciousness. Um, the other possibility, which has been debated since, well, Descartes and way beyond that, is the so-called mind-body problem. Are we computers made out of meat? The mind-body problem and the philosophy of mind uh, explores the idea whether the mind is disjoint or separated uh, some way from the body. And we do have some growing evidence that indeed that is the case. All right, Max, can I get you to respond as to whether or not consciousness from a computer ever would be possible? I think I think it's absolutely possible, and it's interesting. We've talked mostly about whether today's systems are conscious or, or not, and whether they understand or not. 
But I think it's very clear, regardless of that, that future systems absolutely will be able to do everything we want. And I find it kind of nutty, actually, and reckless that humanity is just forging ahead, building these ever more powerful systems uh, without even really um, thinking too much about the, the, the implications. I think there's a 50% chance that within my lifetime, you know, machines that we have ultimately built will kill all humans. And, and why are we not... Um, talking more about it at this stage? Well, as long as we're putting percentages out there, Melanie, I note that you had an online discussion with a so-called philosopher of consciousness, David Chalmers, and he gave AI a 20% chance of consciousness in 10 years. What do you think of that claim? Uh, I don't think you can put percentages on it. And I think David Chalmers really agrees with that, that he was, you know, he sort of doing it kind of just to give a number. There's no way to calculate the probability of this. We really don't even understand our own consciousness very well, even though there are, as Robert said, theories of consciousness, but nobody agrees on what it is, how to explain it, how it works in the brain. And until we understand our own consciousness, our own intelligence better, I don't think we can really put any kind of percentage on achieving it in a certain number of years in machines. So I would say that, that those kinds of claims are, are really take them with a big grain of salt. Well, Robert, I need to ask you about one of your more colorful characterizations of the possibility of consciousness here. You've compared okay. those who believe that AI consciousness is possible to a naive young boy standing in front of a pile of horse manure. You want to explain what you meant by that? <laughs> <laughs> sure. Well, this this gets back to the list that I made of the different uh, different uh, models of consciousness. This model of consciousness believes that there's going to be an emergence. That is, as the complexity of computers gets greater and greater and greater, there's going to be a gradual emergence of of, of a consciousness. And the story goes back to. Um, yeah, this, this is kind of a lay story, if you will. But a little boy that's in a room with horse manure, and he's he's all happy. He's taking the manure, and he's throwing it behind his back, and he's excited. And somebody asks him, what are you doing? And he says, well, with all of this all of this uh, horse manure, there must be a pony in here somewhere. And I think that that's very similar to what's happening with this emergence sort of behavior. With all this complexity, like Tononi's model and some of these other emergence models, there must be some consciousness in here somewhere. I, need, I see no evidence of that, and um, so that's my story. I remember when Ronald Reagan told that joke about 45 years ago, and he got a good laugh he from did. it, too. Yes, he did. <laughs> okay. okay, having said that, Max, you have an expression here. You think uh, many people are suffering from carbon chauvinism. What do you mean by that? I mean, we pat ourselves on the head and tell ourselves that we're so special because we're, we're made of carbon atoms. And, and, and I think you know, the, the honest truth is we need to be more humble and uh, acknowledge that our intelligence and our consciousness has to do with information being processed in certain ways. And there's no reason whatsoever that machines can't when they do that. And I think even though it's true that we don't understand enough about consciousness, and we shouldn't trust percentages. I think um, that should not lull us into a false sense of security and think that machines can't wipe us out just because they're not conscious. You know, if you're chased by a heat-seeking missile, you don't care if it's conscious or not. You, you don't care about this question of whether it's what it feels or whether it feels like anything to be a heat-seeking missile. You just care about its behavior, right? And it's perfectly plausible that we could build such powerful machines in our lifetime that they would wipe out humanity without being conscious. And in some ways, if they did that, that would be even worse than if we were wiped out by conscious machines. At least if, the, if our descendants on this planet are conscious and are having all sorts of cool experiences, you could maybe feel a little bit better about it, thinking, thinking of them as our ancestors. Maybe they have some of our values and will enjoy the next billions of years. But if we just replaced humanity by a bunch of unconscious zombies, I mean, isn't that the most pathetic ending to humanity you could imagine? You know, the ultimate zombie apocalypse where the rest of our great potential here in the universe is just a, a play for empty benches with no one experiencing anything, no joy, nothing. Okay, when Max said this a few moments ago about the, the possibility that machines 
uh, have a 50% chance of wiping us all out uh, during the course of his lifetime. I did let it go then, but he's come back to it, so we got to go there now. Melanie, what do you think of that claim? Um, I don't think it's the machines who are going to wipe us out per se. I think it's, um, I don't know about the 50%. That seems overly pessimistic to me. But I do think the biggest danger comes from humans misusing these machines, not the machines getting out of control and wiping us out. I think that um, we tend to overestimate the probability of machines becoming overly intelligent and underestimate the probability of humans misusing them. And there's so many ways in which these machines can be misused to um, harm us, either, as Max might say, using them in some kind of military uh, situation in a war, or even more prosaically to um, harm people through uh, civil rights kind of violations with their biases or harm them with misinformation that they spread on the web that, you know, humans use them to spread on the web. So I would say humans, as usual, in, in these technologies mm -hmm. are the real problem, not the machines themselves. Robert, you want to take a kick at that prediction? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, let, let me just comment on, on the flavor of the questions and the answers. I believe that the large language models that we're talking about today are just a tempest in a teapot. Other people have made prophecies. Here's my prophecy. And this has delayed scrutiny, like uh, it's going to be 10 years down the road, 40 years down the road. In 10 years or 40 years, nobody's going to care that we made that we made this forecast. But here, here is my prophecy. In a few years, we will adapt to large language models like we have adapted to other adapted to other technology like deep fakes, computer viruses, uh, email spam, and industrial robots. We only have to look at history to see a pattern of this. I'm old enough to remember the Y2K bug. It was totally going to destroy the world. No, it didn't. Deep fakes a few years ago were going to totally destroy politics. We were going to see deep fakes all over the place disrupting things. Even open, open AI, when they released GPT-2, said, oh my gosh, this is just too dangerous of stuff. We're not going to release it because it could be used for Twitter accounts for fake news. Um, Self-driving cars a few years ago, everybody was afraid it was going to just disrupt society by taking over all of the truck driver jobs and a number of the service industries. And that, you know, that that's something that we've adopt, adapted to. So I think, again, this is this is a lot of this is just a tempest in a teapot. It's exciting to talk about. It's exciting to talk about speculations. But we're discovering more and more limitations of these large language models. And we have to remember, and I think this this bill on what Melanie said is that is that AI is a tool. And the question is, how do we use it safely and how do we use it effectively? And that's going to be that's going to be an answer for the future as it begins to meld and become a part of our society. Max, has Robert managed to uh, convince you not to be so negative or pessimistic about the future yet? <laughs> I have a lot of positive hopes as well, but <clears throat> to realize those dreams, of course, we need to not screw up. I I, um, I agree strongly with Melanie that you know, if you're not worried about machines themselves taking over and wiping us out, just spend a moment thinking about your least favored leader on the planet and imagine that they are the first to have control over the super intelligence and impose their will on the world. You know, that's that's concern enough. And I, I think I think uh, we uh, we need to ask ourselves why is it that we are forging ahead, building all these ever more complicated AI models that we don't even fully understand. When we don't do that with other stuff like human cloning, you know, wouldn't it be cool to just make 10,000 clones of Wayne Gretzky? So every <laughs> little high school in Canada could have better hockey games. Why have we banned that or taken a time out on it? Because we realize that this is a very powerful technology. We don't fully understand the implications. So we're like, okay, let's cool it a little bit, think it over. Uh, whereas with AI, it's just full steam ahead. And, you know, even even aside from uh, the possibility that uh, we'll get an Orwellian dystopia where your least favorite leader sort of took over the planet with AI or lost maybe lost control over it and, and, and we all died. Even aside from that, just look at what's happening now. The kettle in the teapot, these large language models, you know, what are we doing with them? What exactly that's supposed to be so great? Before, we were told that we were going to use AI and robots to eliminate the dangerous jobs, the boring jobs, 
the people. I'm all for that. But but now, if you play with ChatGPT, you can see that they can actually eliminate poets' jobs, artists' <laughs> jobs, musicians' jobs, authors' jobs. Some of the jobs that we feel are most meaningful as humans. What, why are we even thinking that this is a good thing to do? Shouldn't it? Shouldn't we be asking instead, what is best for humanity and in terms of tech development, human cloning? And no, uh, let's not do that. We're replacing all the exciting jobs um, so we can have more boring jobs. No, I think this is a democracy question. We should ask ourselves, you know, what use of this tech is actually good for people? I think there are a lot of fantastic uses of AI. Let's figure out how to cure cancer, how to lift everybody out of poverty, how to have a sustainable environment, et cetera, et cetera. But just building these models because someone can make a buck off of it that eliminates many of the things that give people meaning and, in and fueled income inequality, I think that's a net negative. Well, let me pluck a, a question out of that and build on it with uh, perhaps the other side of the coin by asking Robert about the subtitle of his book, What You Do That Artificial Intelligence Never Will. Can you help us out on that, Robert? Sure, I can. Uh, going back to Alan Turing in the 1930s, he proved that there were things and problems which are non-algorithmic. These are problems which are proven to not be able to be executed by uh, computers. Since then, some of the great theoreticians such as Solomonoff and uh, Gregory Chaitin have added to this list. And we see that there are a lot of things which simply can't be computed. This begs the question, are there things which humans do which are non-computable? This was Roger Penrose's idea in The Emperor's New Mind, and, and this is where I, I learned about it. And he makes a very convincing, uh, convincing answer. So if there are non-algorithmic things, if there are non-algorithmic things that we do, they cannot be simulated by a computer. I would say the obvious ones are love, compassion, empathy, these sort of emotions. The more subtle ones are creativity, understanding, and sentience, when properly defined. Those look to be, in my mind thus far, non-algorithmic. All right, Melanie, let me give you an example here and get you to comment on this. Um, fear. Let's take an example of fear. You're in the country. You encounter a bear. As a human, you naturally experience fear. Your heart rate will skyrocket. The hairs on the back of your neck will stand up on end. The palms of your hands will get sweaty. You will have this flight reaction that will take place. If you were to describe this feeling, inevitably you will reference what's happening inside your body. Question, do we therefore need a body to feel fear? That's a great question. Uh, I don't think anyone knows the answer. I, you know, my, I feel like we do, yes, uh, but of course a lot of emotions take place in, in the brain and aren't necessarily, requ don't necessarily require body, all the body parts to, to, to uh, experience them. But I think that's a, the, the, one of the big questions of AI is like to how much do we need a body to really uh, have a full intelligence? How much is our intelligence uh, sort of specific to our particular kind of body? Do we need emotions to be intelligent? Is an intelligence separable from all these kinds of things? And I don't really know the answer, and I don't think anyone does. And this, you know, there's been a debate about this in the cognitive science world, in the AI world, and, you know, I think it's really an important question that we under, try and understand this better. Computers now can't experience emotions. They don't have the kind of brains, if you will, or, or you know, sense, sensory apparatus to experience anything like human emotions. But what's needed for that? I don't think we know. And you know, going back to what Robert said, the, he, he's assuming that um, a computer could never experience an emotion, even in principle. But I don't think that there's the evidence to support that yet. Robert, so you want to really come back on that? It's really a scientific question. You want to come back on well, that, Robert? I, well, I would say that there's no evidence that uh, AI has ever experienced an emotion. You can, you can, um, you can have the AI says, "I feel love." Uh, Lambda, in, in the conversation with Blake Lemoyne, said, you know, um, 
what makes you what makes me happy being with family and just sitting around being with family come on that's that's something that it plagiarized from the net that it just borrowed um lambda has no family and so I, 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 I guess I reject the idea that emotions have been displayed by artificial intelligence to date. Okay, Max, you want to take a kick at that? Yeah, I, I think even though it sounded like a big disagreement between Melanie and, and Robert, there really wasn't because Robert is talking about AI up until now and, and Melanie was saying in the future, she sees no reason why machines in principle couldn't do these things. I, I like the humility here, and I, I sh the Melanie articulated, I share it. I think plenty of things we don't know, but I think we also have to be humble in the sense of realizing that the, the, the space of art of, of machine minds is vastly bigger than the kind of minds that, that we're familiar with and need not be anything like ours. I don't think you need to have a body to feel fear because I've had nightmares, which happened in my brain when my body wasn't involved at all. And uh, I also think that um, it's a mistake to say that we won't be able to figure out how to build very intelligent machines or consciousness machines just because we don't understand how our brains work. Because that's just like saying, hey, we're never going to figure out how to build airplanes until we first figure out how, how to build a mechanical bird. There's a TED talk where you can see a mechanical bird actually working now, but that took 100 years longer than, than uh, <laughs> it took to build the airplane. And, and, mm -hmm. and, there are much simpler ways of making flying machines. And I think in the same way, we're, gonna, we're seeing that there are much simpler ways of building thinking machines than um, that nature came up with, simply because nature had its hands tied. Nature had to figure out how to build a thinking machine on the constraint that it had to be able to assemble itself. And it had to also be able to do it out of just a handful of the most pot common atoms that are found in nature. And the engineers today, they don't have to worry about either of those two things. We still don't have a self-assembling computer, but we have. So, so I think we're going to first figure out how we work, actually, by first building artificial minds and then have them help us figure out how the brain works. Okay. We're down to our last 30 seconds here. Robert, let me give it to you and ask the ethical question here. The fact that we maybe can do this doesn't answer the question of whether we should do this. Should we be building AI systems that might someday be conscious or super intelligent? Well, um, let me answer that from, from an engineer's perspective. There's two types of ethics associated with AI. One is design ethics. Design ethics says that you should design the artificial intelligence to do what it's supposed to do and nothing else. The other is um, what you do with it. This is the end user ethics. Like for example, should a military commander in the field decide to use an autonomous AI weapon like the Harpy, which goes around and uh, waits to be illuminated by, by radar and then goes and takes out the installation with a kamikaze boom. Um, wh you know, when, when should we use that? When should we, should we go ahead and do this? I will tell you that unfortunately the smoke is out of the bottle. And if, if we don't do it in the United States, it's going to be done somewhere else. There's lots of very high tech people that are very interested in, in pursuing this. And uh, I don't even think it's, it's a question that we can answer. The other thing I would say is that we are riding on a hype curve. There is an incredible amount of hype associated with with large language models that hype curve is eventually as we find out the limitations going to take a deep dive into skepticism and then reach what i call an asymptote of asymptote of reality where we find out the true uses of of this um of this result but um yeah, I, I, I think that, yes, we have to go full bore. I think especially not only in academia, but I think that the military uh, specifically has to look at the use of AI in warfare because our adversaries are doing the same thing. Gotcha. That's got to be the last word today, but certainly not the last word on this subject, to be sure. I want to thank Melanie Mitchell from the Santa Fe Institute, Robert J. Marks at Baylor University, Max Tegmark at MIT for an utterly fascinating conversation on one of the biggest issues around today. Thank you so much, you three. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.